Hey guys, characters here for GrinderSchool.com. I'm making the second part of Bustin' Dem Leaks of the member session review series today. And we've got a video that Grinder School member K45606 has been kind enough to send me where he's four tabling 25 no limit. And we're just going to go through his video, pick out some spots where he can improve his play. And um, the general sort of leak finder thing, same as what we did with Mad Taco last week. I have. Um, Pomegranate juice is really good. It's really cheap, nasty pomegranate juice, but it's awesome. I'd highly recommend any pomegranate juice. It's pretty awesome. Definitely a good, a good sidekick when you're making a video anyway. So this this cartoon here, I have substituted the fish from last week, and I've now got this moronic fish, who is again, in no way supposed to embody the Grinder School member who sent me this video, nor is it meant to represent any of you guys. It's just simply a dumb fish who I'm giving advice to. And I'm, and I'm saying, what do you think his range is? What's your opponent's range in this spot, Mr. Dumb Redfish? And the Dumb Redfish is saying, I put him on the flush draw. He has flush draw. He's a chaser. And I'm like, <sighs> because obviously this is a mistake a lot of people make. You tell someone to put their opponent on a range for a reason. It's because you can't just be all... Daniel Negreno's soul read style and put a guy on exactly a flush draw because your opponent is just some guy sitting on a computer at the other end of the world. You don't have amazing live reads on him that you know he has a draw. He has a range of hands, okay? He doesn't just have a draw. So to say, I made this bet because I put him on a flush draw is a common thing fish say that's just hugely illogical and wrong because, well, that's a common thing that new players say. It's wrong because your opponent has a range of hands. Sure, some of those hands might be flush draws. But remember, we always need to be looking at our opponent's range on the whole um, as for what it is, you know, in total, not just picking out one part of it and playing against that. So, common trap, make sure you don't fall into the trap that our dumb red fish here has fallen into because all you're going to get is a sigh from me and it's not going to help your game and it's not going to help you improve. You always want to be practicing your ranging skills, your hand reading skills, how well can you put someone on a range of hands and how effectively can you then play against that range. Remember, that's what poker's all about, so... That's a lesson to be taken away from that. Okay, let's get into the video now. <clears throat> um, so we have about 40 minutes of footage here. We're not going to get through all of that. We'll get through as much as we can. I'm probably just going to move on to the next member after this because I've started to get enough interest now that we should be able to do four or five of these pretty easily. But, I mean, I'm still looking for one more. I think I've got four people, and I'm going to do five in total. So... One spot is still available. Um, I'd highly recommend you get in there and nab it before anyone else does. Send me a send me a PM on Grinder School, just requesting that you get the spot. It's going to be first come first served unless there's some reason that you're not applicable, like you don't normally play six max or something. I'd favour someone who does play six max as their regular game, and I want someone who plays twenty five NL to one hundred NL. So if you fall into that group, you know, send me a PM quickly. Pause the video, send it now, just to make sure you get that last place, because it is a free coaching session, basically, um, and it's well worth taking advantage of. Okay, so we've got four tables here, and on table three, we start off by flatting an open from middle position with pocket sixes. What do I think about this? Um, well, only... Well, I don't really like it. I don't think it's going to be that plus EV to do this, if at all. Probably going to be a slightly losing play, actually. Um, the reason it's not good is that this guy isn't even 100 deep, right? So we're like, you know, like something like 80, just under 80 BBs deep. Like 78 big blinds deep or something like that. So set odds are not actually great here because he's not really deep enough to give us a whole lot of value. Yes, we can win like his 70 big blinds, you know, and we're only risking like 3 pre-flop or whatever in order to do that. So that's one argument for calling. But the thing is, we're out of position, so it's going to be harder to get initiative. We don't know anything about the guy. His range might not even be that tight. You know, he's, he could just easily quite be quite easily be a loose sort of... He's obviously not a regular, so it's unlikely to be a net. He may just be a loose player that's actually not opening all that strong a range, so implied odds aren't actually that great. Now, the other thing about sixes, and I say this about a lot of pocket pairs, I'd say sevens here we could probably call um, it'd be okay. Eights would definitely be happy flatting. 
Hand like sixes though, every flop is still going to be pretty terrible that doesn't contain a six, okay? And we've already just established that when we do make our set, we're not even that likely to get paid off and we're not even getting paid off for 100 BBs, okay? So, set ours aren't great. And it'll play so badly out of position that we're going to flop things like this, like 752. This is one of the, you know, top 10% of flops for our hand or something like that, right? That don't include sixes, of course. And on this board, yes, we can check all the street here. Um, I wouldn't recommend leading here against any random middle position opener because you'll get bluff raised, you'll get like played back up, you're in a terrible spot. You won't even get value from many worse hands because he doesn't have many small pocket pairs or 5x or deuce x. So, wouldn't lead, and I definitely would. Uh, you know, you could check call one here, but then you don't know anything about his turn barrel and frequencies. He bets really big on the flop. I don't even like calling this C bet because we're going to be burning money so frequently. Like the times that we then have to check the turn and river, like a quarter of those times or something, he's actually going to hit an overcard or improve to the best hand anyway, right? So he has equity against us. If we raise here, you know, his range might be fairly strong for C-Bet in this big on this flop. It might just be burning money. I don't think we can bluff profitably here with, like, no equity. We're not going to get him off any better hand, basically. Um, and there might not even be enough weak hands that it's plus EV to raise here. So calling and raising are both going to be fairly bad. Um, so it looks like this is just a fold to the C-Bet on the flop because we don't know anything about the guy and we're going to get owned in the turn going to get barreled off our hand or he's going to make the best hand so we're not going to be able to play this profitably out of position over multiple streets and that's precisely why I don't like calling pre-flop in the first place we don't have the set odds to justify it therefore taking a a flat well we don't know we have the implied odds you know we're only 80 BBs deep and his range may well be you know kind of loose kind of wide so we might not have implied odds and you know we're going to constantly get into spots like this where we just have to check fold the flop because we cannot continue profitably. There's either there's too many overcards on the flop for us to call down profitably, or the overcards will come in the turn. We won't know whether we can call down barrels. We'll be one calling one to then fold and burning money, folding the best hand a ton. It's a nightmare situation out of position. Okay, so fold this pre. Um, if the guy was say 120 BBs deep, that'd be okay. Set mine and even against a random who we thought may well be a fish, you know, that'd be fine. Um, but yeah, or if this guy was super tight, like net opening range, you got an easy set mine. If you're like 100 BB steep, then you can fold on the flop happily to see bet. But here, you know, don't even have those things. So I may have laboured that out, drawn it out a little bit, maybe laboured it a little too much. But you get the point. I do want to stress that because those spots are common spots where people burn money. So be careful with these really smallish pairs, smallish medium pairs out position when implied odds aren't good, because you're currently you're constantly going to get yourself into a bad situation post flop. And to be negative EV in the process. Right, so, table three, this guy isolates the limper, and um, we have aces. I just like a three bet here, let's just make it like 3x or something, you know, make it like 375, $4, get more money in the pot, we're out of position, you know, we'd, we don't want to give him like an amazing price to just call profitably with like any pair or something like that and set minus. So, we can expect to get value here, you know, the guy's range might it might be fairly wide here, but what can you do? You could flat and allow the fish to come along as well. That's certainly not a terrible play here with aces if you thought this guy was going to fold to a load of three bets, but without that information, like, building the pot is really important here, so I, I don't hate a flat, but I quite like a, th I like a three bet more. I can understand why you would flat to keep the fish in with a bunch of hands that he's going to go broke with top pair with and stuff like that. You know, it's not a horrible play by any means, but when we don't have position here, I like just 3-betting and getting the pot heads up with this guy, you know, get building the pot, setting up a nice stack to pot ratio that allows us just to get all the money in, in three streaks. The 3-bet size is a little bit small here. I mean, now he can just call, like, pocket fours here, and he's only putting in a dollar twenty-five, you know, to win, like, a bazillion, like the whole stack basically, and he, he's going to give us a really strong range for making this min bet. So technically, he can set minus here really well. He can like, he can call and actually be correct in doing so, even if he's going to fold a lot on the flop. We want to make it so that he's at least making a mistake by continuing with a lot of the worst hands that he's still likely to continue with. So I'd make it like four bucks here. I don't really see the point in this little min raise. It's the other dude's still going to fold here. You're not going to get him to unless he's a huge whale. You're not going to get him to tag along any lighter by making it two fifty than you are by making it four. So you know, concentrate on building the pot here, um, and obviously just not, not giving the guy a great price to set mine and just call to try and bust your aces. This is almost as bad as just flatting the aces and then, like, going broke and then moaning about it, you know, that old cliche. Um, we can make it more here, get more value, build the pot right position, you know, set up a good SPR to just 
bet, bet, bet over three streets and get it in. We won't need to bet too big, you know, it'll be fine. Um, we get more value post flop, uh, pre flop, and more, most importantly, we don't give them this great price just to come along in position with a bunch of hands that can play fit or fold profitably against our strong range here. Okay, so he calls and we get a good flop. We just want to start going bet, bet, bet here. There's loads of like Jack X. One advantage to this small C bet, 3 bet, is that it has left in a bunch of Broadway hands that are now maybe going to go broke. So it's not too terrible, but I do prefer it to be bigger. The C bet size here is fine. If we bet 3 here, you can work it out. We'll be able to bet half pot on the turn, half pot on the river as well. And we're going to be able to get it in like comfortably. Um, doing it over three streets with that sort of stack to pot ratio is fine. Remember, in a three bet pot, when we've got a hand we can bet three streets for value with, we, the first thing we want to calculate is what sort of sizing is going to be good, um, why it's going to be good, um, because basically, how many streets can we get it in on? Basically, that's what we want to be thinking about, and we want to plan our bet sizing so that it leaves our opponent's range um, as wide as we can to get value, basically. So, in a spot like that, we can sort of go half pot, half pot, half pot. Yeah, the board's a bit dry, but if we start potting it and shoving turns, we're probably, we're probably, you know, value cutting ourselves a bit. We're taking away a lot of the equity we would have by betting small over three streets. So, I like the bet size on the flop there. Um, I can't really see this guy's stack on table one. Um, if that's thirty-two and he's like a full stack regular again, this is like, this is a very similar spot to the first hand in my tacos uh, session where we have like a late position isolator and we were in a small blind with a hand that is probably not quite strong enough to flat for this price but we should have plenty fold equity by actually 3 bet in here so it's not a bad spot to 3 bet this guy is like 20 20 over 5 hands he can easily be a reg he's got a very regular sizing I'll assume he's full stacked and he's got like 32 bucks here or something um, if he's not full stack if that's like 22 or something I don't like it because he's way more likely to be stationary versus 3 bets it's just something you can infer from stack sizes, so that depends. But if he's full stack there and he's got more than 100 BBs, then we can certainly go ahead and make a 3-bit bluff here and expect fold equity to be quite good. But yeah, folding would be my, my next choice. 3x on the button is going to be standard opening size, so that's good. Unless, of course, we're getting played back at a lot and stuff, in which case I'd recommend min-raising or 2.5xing just to combat the aggression so that when you're folding all the time you're losing less and also you've got more room to play back post flop and pre flop if you choose to versus an active three better and again we want to be opening really wide from the cutoff in the button king eight off suit I can forgive you folding that in the cutoff that's kind of close for me I might open that sometimes king nine I would open um, it's one of those borderline sort of hands but yeah in general we're going to be looking to make sure that um, this member's sorry the, the name's a bit of a mouthful so if I don't pronounce it every time with all the numbers then forgive me but basically we'll be making sure that his opening ranges are sufficiently wide, that he's using position, he's c-betting and taking advantage, isolating, you know all the basic core skills you need to beat 25 and L. Be making sure he's doing all those while improving his lines post flop as well, so. That's what we're aiming to achieve with these videos. Just get you get you guys playing a really solid 6 max game to beat 25 and L, because like I say, you don't need to be FPSA, like fancy play syndrome, you don't need to be doing too much crazy stuff. Just simply looking out for spots where you might have fold equity while keeping a an, a nice wide opening range from the cut from the button. Like 6-9 offsuit there, open that. Don't fold that. You've got no reason to fold it. You've got one guy in the small blind who's like 120 or whatever so far. Um, I assume that's his VPIP PFR. Um, oh no, sorry. VPIP 28, PFR 27, right. Um, over 75 hands. Yeah, whatever. He's a regular. It's 3-bet number... I'm not sure what that is. One second, what I'm going to do is... I'm going to pause the video for a sec and I'll be right back. I'm just going to check exactly what this HUD layout is because I think I've got it somewhere. Okay, so I'll be back in a sec. Okay, I'm back. And this is the HUD here. So we know what we're doing. We've got 3-bet um, percentage in the top, then fold 3-bet. Pre-flop aggression factor, which I don't think is that important a stat to have. If you can tell how aggressive someone is pre-flop by their VPIP and PFR, those stats are going to do that anyway. And, you know, their like, fold to steal stat and stuff like that is going to do that as well. Although I'd prefer to see this done by small blind and big blind, because a lot of people are a lot looser in one than they are the other. So it's better to divide those. Just while we're on the topic of HUDs, we may as well critique um, the HUD that um, this guy uses. Um, next line, obviously VPIP, PFR, CBIP, flop, fold to CBIP, good stats to have, all essential. 
um, over a decent sample, these will start to be pretty meaningful, although don't get too attached to them at, at first. But this aggression factor stat is going to mislead you to do some things that might not be exactly correct, it's going to be pretty vague, unless you've got a huge sample, and you can tell all the information it gives you anyway by these stats, you know, you don't need it. So I would get rid of that personally, because it's, I think it's more likely to mislead you than it is to actually help you, to be totally honest. And apart from that, like I'd, I'd divide these by position, small blind and big blind, the steel stats. Apart from that, it's, it's okay. Um, so the three bet percentage we've got there is the first number on the HUD. Okay, so we'll bear that in mind, and we'll go back to this hand where we folded the nine six there. Three bet percent is nine percent. Okay, fair enough. He's three betting kind of wide. The guy in the big blind hasn't done anything. Just go ahead and two point five exit. Unless he shows he's really going to go to town on you over a bigger sample than seventy five hands, you can start folding that. But like I say, you know the big blind hasn't done too much yet. I'm okay opening six nine offsuit there. I think it's fine. Although I can see why you might want to fold if the guy is three betting you. But I'd want a bigger sample. I'd want him to be three betting a bit more than that in order to fold that hand. Again, I just I want to advocate. Uh, sorry, advocate that you guys just open really wide in late position, especially on the button because it is free big blinds. People fold all the time, or they fold on the flop at these limits. They're not giving you trouble, so go ahead and do it. You know, even if you open a hand like 8 6 suited against a terrible player, yes, he won't fold pre flop, but what he will do is he'll either fold on the flop or he'll fold on the. or he'll fold pre flop a lot of the time. And if he doesn't, there'll be times when you actually make a strong hand and he'll go broke with top pair. And you'll outplay him, he'll make loads of mistakes pre flop. When you have position against a weak player's range, even if your hand has not technically got loads of equity versus it, it's still a plus EV situation due to both pre flop and flop e fold equity combined. And also the fact that you have implied odds from him making a lot of mistakes, stacking off too lightly when you make your hand, and just being bad in general, and you have position, okay? So it's really just, don't worry about it, it's really hard to go wrong versus a weak player with a weak range when you're opening in position if you've got anything semi-playable. Yeah, sure, fold 4, do soft suit, but something like 9-6, that's good enough for me. If that guy was a fish, when it's regulars at 3 bet, yes, you might want to tighten up a little bit, so I don't hate the fold. Okay, um, I think we open the... Do we open the jack 10 here? I'm just going to skip back and just check what happened pre flop in the sand on table 1. Yeah, we've got on the button. We open 3x, okay, fine. Well, hopefully, we'll open 6 7 from the cutoff. Because that's a snap open on table 2. Yep, good stuff. Okay, I don't know why we're C betting this board, and if we are going to C bet it, our sizing is like. I guess it's not too terrible, but really I don't think we're really getting any folds at all with this size and when there's two players on this sort of draw board that hits their range as well. First thing we think about in a spot like this when we're determining how well how much we want to see about this flop is what are our opponents' ranges here? Like how do they connect with this board? How much fold equity can we expect to have? The answer to that question is pretty much not very much fold equity at all. These guys this 43-0 guy, sure, he's got a wide range, but then you've got the regular here as well. You've got two of them to worry about. Um, you've got a really sort of connected middling board that hits, like, the suited connectors and middling cards and middling pairs that the reg is going to play, like, very hard. Uh, the fish is going to have a bunch of draws here, you know, like, gut shot stuff he isn't going to fold, flush draws. Um, just random pairs of sixes and nines and fours. So you're not going to get two folds here enough here, you don't have any equity, if you had like a gut shot and two overs I might see a bit here, but we don't, I'd just rather you gave up in this spot, to be honest, you're not going to have enough fold equity. And the other trouble with betting one dollar here is yes, you give yourself a really good price, but the guy to your left looks like a total station, you might even get peeled by like ace high and stuff when you bet one dollar here, like sometimes, because he can be a station. So yeah, you're giving yourself a good price, but even then I still don't think you're getting enough folds. Like, you're risking $1 here to take down a, a, a pot of $2, um, plus your one back, so three. So you need you need to get folds about 25% of the time or something like that. Um, wait, is that right? No. We'll just do a quick uh, proof of this. So you're betting one, and if you take down the pot, you're going to get your one back plus the 214, so we're doing like 1 over 3.14. So we need folds 31% of the time, okay, to take down the, the hand here. I don't think we're going to get two folds 31% of the time here, I think it's way more likely it's like 20% or something, 
Now we do have some equity, so we might not need folds that often because we'll make a pair on the turn. We have a back there straight well, we'll make a straight by the river sometimes and get to see the river. So we probably only need folds like maybe 28% of the time or something, I, I guess, but then it's hard to say for sure. But I don't think we get folds even that often. I think one of these guys is going to call this C-bet like a really high, like 80% of the time one, one of these guys is going to call here, at least. Um, on this sort of board texture, so I don't like the see bet. I'd rather just give up in this spot. If you had more equity, you wouldn't need as much fold equity. So you could go ahead if you had like I don't know, um, ten eight here with a backdoor flush draw or something like that. Go ahead and see bet for sure. But with just two over cards um, and a backdoor straight draw, I don't really. I don't think it's too bad, but I don't think we're getting enough folds even for this price. And I think obviously the less we bet, the less folds we actually get as well. So I like a give up there. Um, fives is going to be quite an easy come along for the ride type of set mind spot. Pot odds are really good, implied odds are good. Um, if we hit our set, there's three people in the pot already. It's likely one of them's going to have something type thing. So, obviously, remember the more multi way you get, the better implied odds are. So this is completely different here than that hand with the pocket sixes because implied odds are far far better as well as pot odds, and we can play fair or fold far more comfortably and be plus EV doing so. Table two. Um, we get called by both these guys, the flops kind of wet-ish, not terribly wet. Um, we have we have about their flush draw, this is a better board, I think we get more folds because a lot of their range is going to be like middling suited cards, um, like if they have, they're, they don't look like stations, so if they have like king queen here they may well fold, um, stuff like that, so there's a ton of better hands we can get folds from here, I bet like two dollars and expect to get folds enough of the time in this spot on table too, so I like a see bet there. I wouldn't be barreling at all if called, because I'm betting there with expecting them to actually fold um, pocket pairs. So I don't know why we're betting like the Jack-10 hand and we're not betting this flop, even though this is actually a far less good flop for our opponent's ranges and one that we actually figured to have way more fold equity on. So that's something to think about there. Um, think about C-betting, how well board textures connect with likely pre-flop ranges of your opponents. Oh, were we four-way there? Sorry, I didn't realise that. Yeah, I'm okay with the give up in that case. If we're a three-way, I'd see about there. Four-way, yeah, I like. I actually like that. I didn't see that dude at the top right there. And we're folding on the flop with fives. That's obviously standard. Missed our set. Nothing else to say about that. I just did the weekly shop. It was horrendous because it was raining really bad. I think it's been raining so hard in Scotland like the last few few days. Got totally soaked, but I, like, I've stocked up my flat now. I don't need to go out again tonight, so I'm going to just sit and do stuff I've got to do. Fun times, and I've got lots of juice and things to eat and drink, so happy days. Ace Queen, I'm going to be looking to ISO this when it comes round. I'd say if you've got a limper and right position, 5x is going to be fine. Wouldn't make it any less than that. You want to charge them. Um, you want to build a pot as well with a hand like Ace Queen, and you do, you do want to get it like heads up with them. You don't want other people coming along with the ride and stuff. Um, now we've got an I've got a raise on the button from an eighteen nine. He looks really tight here. I don't like a three bet here. I think like versus a lot guys, you can three bet this hand for value. But Ace Queen suited plays so well. If you can get this poster to come along, you know he's going to be getting a really nice price. There's plenty of dominated crap he can call with as well. Um, and the 18-9 guy isn't by any means a really loose player, so he might give your 3-bet a lot of respect and he might have quite a tight range to begin with. So it could be the case that if you 3-bet here, you're not actually getting much value, you're just doing sort of mediocrely versus his continuing range, if not poorly. So something to think about if he's a regular, you know, who's ISO in that guy super wide and he knows you can 3-bet, absolutely 3-bet for value, you'll get peeled by a lot worse. But in this spot, I definitely just prefer a call here pre-flop. And the other bonus to that is you get the bad, the weaker player, the poster, to come along with a lot of dominated flush draws and dominated pair flopping hands that you can just expect to get loads of value from. So don't like this 3-bet. Um, you might want to think about what I've said there about why, about the fact that you're not going to get much value. It's really plus EV to leave the fish in. Your hand is going to dominate a load of the guy's opening range, but not much of his continuing range versus your 3-bet, because he's tight and your 3-bet looks strong because he's tight, etc. Um, King Jack, again, I'm not really sure... Um, we know why we're three betting in this spot because we threw it with Ace Queen there without really seeming to give it too much thought. I'm not sure. Maybe you have your reasons for it. You can always comment in the thread um, and let me know what you thought, and I can correct it or go over it with you. Uh, the King Jack. I don't hate the three bet there. I think it's fine. I mean, you've got a 
a guy you don't know much about, but he does look like a regular so far. 36, 36 over 11, regular can stats. Flitting King Jack out of position, even suited, kind of marginal. If we know he opens really wide and we've got some way we can exploit him post flop, like he folds too much to check raises or doesn't see bet enough or see bets way too much or something like that, then we can call if we know what we're doing with a suited hand like King Jack, if we know it dominates a lot of his opening range. But without that information, um, we're just really going to be sort of lost preflops. I don't like a flat. I think we can sort of turn it into a bluff. It's like the top of our folding range type thing. Has a couple of blockers to hands that he will continue strongly with. So, yeah, I'd, I like the three bet there. So just as long as you know why you're three betting, never three bet just for the hell of it. Because never like look at it and go, oh that guy opens wide, I'm going to three bet. Because that's not a reason to three bet. You know, your the reason to three bet is how you're doing versus your opponent's continuing range, and um, whether it's more plus EV than flatting and why, and yeah, reasons like that. Think about his continuing range as well as his opening range when you're three betting, and make sure you understand why you're doing it. And that's obviously to everybody. King nine's a snap open on the button. As is King ten on the cutoff. So a lot of the time we're not actually reviewing like really huge pots where someone took a crazy line or anything like that. We're really trying to drum in really solid pre flop and flop play in these session review videos we're gonna look at sizing, C bet spots, three bet spots, make sure we know why we're doing what we're doing and we've got a sound strategy. So that's really the point. Here we've got back to our flush draw, back to our straight draw and we've got equity. The guy dunks more than pot here. Kinda scary, like it's not a size that looks like he's gonna fold. He doesn't have that much left behind. Most people are not gonna dunk the size and then give up. They're usually protecting something from the flush draw or whatever the hell goes on in their mind, you know. They, they seem to really overvalue protecting their hand a lot of these fishier players so I would give him a fairly strong range when he dunks out here um, if he dunks smaller I would consider just raising as a bluff to try and take it down or even just flatting since we've got plenty of equity and have the best hand a lot but when he makes it this big I think it's likely that regardless of what he has here he's going to bet the turn as well when he bets the flop this big and he's going to try and get a stack in that is what this bet looks like to me I don't think we can call here I don't think we can raise here if we raise we're going to have to get it in due to stack sizes and the equity will have, so I don't like doing that because we're not going to be in great shape and I don't think we have much fold equity either. I don't like flatting because I think we're going to face a turn bet and be forced to fold on non-diamond turns, non -ace or 10 turns all the time. So I'd like a fold here on the flop. If he continues to do this with like loads of hands, if he donks more than the pot like constantly, then we'll look at it and think, right, his range is wider here and we'll look at spots like this. We might ship it in in a spot like this if we thought we had fold equity, but as it stands just now, we don't have fold equity here really, we might have a bit but not enough equity plus fold equity to get this in. And um, we're just about to flush draw on two overs, it does look like he's going to bet the turn if we call. It does look like he's not going to be folding when he makes this bet too often. So it's his sizing here that deters me from wanting to do anything. So this is going to be a fold and we'll take a note of it and look to sort of play back in, in the future in spots like this should he continue to keep doing it with a wide range. You can fold to dunk bets, it's not the end of the world. You don't have some immortal right to the pot just because you were the pre-flop raiser. You know, you can fold in spots like this and not feel too bad about it. That's another common leak that I see, and I'm glad to see him fold there. People will be like, I was pre-flop raiser and he dunked to me, so there's no way I'm giving him the pot. It's like, well, okay, but look at his range. It's strong and it's not folding. Well, it's not necessarily super strong, but you don't have anything. His, your opponent's range is such that he's probably going to want to put more money in the pot due to his sizing doesn't look like he's just going to bluff more than the pot and then give up here. So, you know, you don't need to just arbitrarily think that you should continue solely because you're the pre-flop raiser because that's not a reason to continue. Um, again, that's just a, a common leak that I do see. Not everyone does it, but some people do it, so think about that. If that's maybe one of your leaks, you can fall to dunk bets. Don't feel too bad about it, especially when they're like more than the pot or even pot size dunk bets, fairly scary against the fish with that sort of stack size, doesn't look like he's folding too much, that's the key point of that hand. So our play has been fairly good so far, one spot I would have given up in on the flop, um, instead of c-betting but not doing anything major, obviously that 3-bet sizing with the aces last time is something to look at as well. You'll, you'll work out as you get more experience so that min raising just leads to worse situations where people are profitably calling your three bits. 
a lot of the time. I mean, you can do it. There's certain spots where min 3 betting is good, but I'm going to advocate for you guys just now. Don't do it. Just 3 bet a standard size because you're giving your opponent a, a worse price. You're not allowing them to, to mine you profitably and stuff like that. And you're going to be able to build a pot and get more value. So until you can really understand the reasons why you might want to actually have a plan of min 3 betting versus specific opponents, and we'll deal with that maybe in a later video when that might be good, but it is fancy play syndrome and it's not actually it's not good right now while you guys are all still working on your game and moving up through the micro stakes just avoid it for now okay let's talk about these two spots aces is going to be a three bet against this guy and um, we're out of position no reason to slow play here we just want to build the pot you know value 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 that's the mantra of these stakes um, so we just want to make it like 260 or something on table two on table three um, we're just going to call here with Queen Jack. We dominate a lot of his opening range. We want to leave those hands in. It plays beautifully. It flops well. We don't want to get 4 bet. We don't want to turn it into a bluff. If we want to bluff here, we'll use like Queen 8 suited, a hand that we can't flat as comfortably with. Although that can even be a flat. Something like Queen 4 suited, maybe. No reason to waste Queen Jack here and turn it into a bluff. It's going to play magnificently versus his opening range in position. So just flat it. Going over these decisions before we see what Hero does, just to be impartial and unbalanced about it. I really hate this 3-bet, I think it's horrible. Um, I don't think, again, I don't think we understand why we're 3-betting. Because if you think about our range as a whole, right, we can't 3-bet 100% versus this guy, right, because he's just going to adjust, if you think about our actual game plan. Yeah, we might have fold equity by 3-betting here. However, if we 3-bet, he's going to fold out loads of those random Queen-9 hands and stuff that he was opening before, right, that we were actually doing really well against, okay? He's going to continue with hands that dominate the hell out of his king jack, ace jack, king queen, ace queen, high pairs, stuff like that, you know. So we're not going to be doing that well versus continuing range. So we can't 3 bet for value. And why the hell would we want to turn this into a bluff? Like, think about it. We can flat this so well, it's going to play so nicely, it's going to give us loads of, loads and loads of draws. We're going to flop in pairs, and we have position. We are going to make this guy's life hell by flatting this hand pre flop. As soon as we 3-bet it here, we make his continuing range really strong. Well, not really strong, but strong enough that we're doing terribly against it. Um, we make it so that he folds out a lot of the hands that we could actually get lots of value from post-flop when we flop top pair, like worse queens and jacks. And we open ourselves up to the risk, the possibility of being 4-bet bluffed out of, off of a really plus EV situation. So flat queen jack, bluff queen 6 suited, yeah. Think about your 3-bit strategy in that way um, and try to understand that a hand that plays so well here is a waste to 3-bet it because it only plays well versus opening range and not versus his continuing to a 3-bit range. Two separate ranges, two completely different things. Hand does brilliantly versus the former and pretty badly versus the latter, so don't turn it into a bluff. Bluff with something you can't flat so profitably. Calls. Now we get pretty good board. We don't know what this guy's tendencies are in continuing to a 3-bet because we only have like 20 hands on the guy and as it is he, I think he's called or not folded the only other time he's been 3-bet so far which is maybe indicative that he's he doesn't like to fold 3-bets which makes this even worse because you know we're going to get called by low, all sorts of dominating broadways and stuff like that Um, on this board I'd go ahead and I'd fire a c-bet here and I would barrel like some turns if I got like an ace turn or a 10 turn I'd probably barrel or 9 turns because we've got better equity and there's some like lower pocket pairs we can fold out some of the time. Probably just a 10 turn and ace turn here at barrel. Probably nothing else. But I'd, I'd see about this board just because he can be peeling wide with like ace queen, ace jack here and loads of stuff like that. And we can get folds from like ace high and stuff like that. I'd make it fairly small. Yeah, that's not too bad a sizing. Could even be a bit smaller. We get hugely 4 bet here. Just ship it in with aces. This guy's never going anywhere. Get all the money in right now while he can on table 2. Good. 10, a barrel that turn, gives us loads more equity, we fold out 9s, 8s, 7s, all that sort of shit now that we didn't before, um, 5x if he has it for some reason, uh, if he calls a turn it's very likely as a king, see I would definitely bet that turn because it's like one of the turns that A puts out a second scare card to his, a lot of his pairs and B it gives us a load of equity so we don't actually need that many folds and we don't expect to get raised on the turn like hardly ever, if he's got a king he's going to call and let's see the river and we'll stack kings on the river when we make our hand so bit of implied odds on those cards and we do a fold equity so I'd bet like half pot again expect to fold out like pocket nines, eight, seven, sixes, ace five, whatever the hell he peeled the flop with. Now I wouldn't relight any bluffs here that would be terrible let's just check back not going to get him off a king. See nines he probably get that to fold on the turn but 
Take a note then that he flats the 3-bet blind versus blind with 9s. A lot of guys will 4-bet and try and get that sort of hand in. But the big mistake in that hand is pre-flop. It's a pretty big error. Um, it's definitely a call for the reasons I went over. Ace 10s could be an easy open blind versus blind. You can make it 3x. I tend to like to make it a little bit more blind versus blind just because it sucks when people like play a wide range and give you shit when they have position on you. I like to give them a worse price so that they can't call as profitably pre-flop without initiative and stuff. So I make it maybe 3.5, 3.3 3 or something like that. That's sort of what I go for, but I'm kind of fussy with sizing. I'm a bit of a sizing geek, to be honest. Alright, let's talk about this ISO size. I want to make this a little bit bigger here. Um, we do want to get isolate this guy. That's the point of an ISO raise. Our hand plays okay multi-way, but we're going to be isolating a range against this guy that we want to isolate him. We want to isolate him and see about the flop and take it down. Or isolate him and then get loads of value from him and keep him to ourselves. Right, That's our plan. That's why it's called an ISO. Because it is to ISO the guy. So if you want to ISO this guy, and A, have any chance of him folding pre-flop, B, build a bigger pot that you can take down with your C-bets or get value from when he calls, right? So those are reasons to make it bigger. And C, you don't want to offer these guys great odds in the small and big blind to come along in a multi-way pot and get a piece of the fish as well. You want the fish to yourself. You want this limper to yourself so you can C-bet and capitalize on fold equity post-flop. If you get three other guys to come along in the pot, you can no longer C-bet flops profitably. Right, so there goes, like, boom, there goes, like, half of your plan. Your plan at, the, at these sort of stakes is to isolate and continuation bet and really exploit the fact that people limp, call, and play fit or fold post-flop. Okay, so I'd make it, like, 1.10, $1.10, something like that. I'd definitely make it big enough that you can achieve those things that I've just went over there. And we get raised by someone we know really not very much about. Well, he's 26, 24, right. 7% 3 bet. Can he be light here? Yeah, sure, sometimes. Does our hand play very well? No. Other that much implied odds? No, because the preflop raiser's range might not even be that wide. The fish is only like, you know, 35 big blinds deep, so there's not implied odds from him. Just fold here. One seventy five dollar one dollar seventy five here is enough that it's going to be burning money to continue with your total lack of implied odds in this sort of spot. So this is going to be a fold pre flop here. A lot of guys will call in this spot but we don't have the the odds to here unless the fish is also full stacked, then we could consider calling with our implied odds, given the fish will play badly and make mistakes and stuff. So I like the fold. Three four, I'm gonna isolate this. I'm gonna isolate wider than I'm gonna open. And the reason for that is that I just really want to take advantage of these weak players. When someone's put money in the pot and they've limped and they look like a fish like this 53-7 guy, you want to take a wider range because it's imperative that you get to play against this guy as much as you can in position and see bet him and make him fold pre-flop, on the flop, whenever you make him fold, and also to build a pot to stack him when you make your hand and stuff like that. So I'd go ahead, make it like a dollar here at least. I wouldn't open 3-4 in middle position, but I would ISO it there. So I hope you understand the difference there. Limping is kind of meh, it's okay. I'd also advise you guys, until you really know what you're doing with limping versus ISOing, and you understand to a better extent good spots to limp versus good spots to ISO, and very briefly, I don't want to dwell on this, but a good spot to limp might be a short player sort of limps in, you have no fold equity with an ISO, and you have a small pocket pair that's going to flop terribly, and you don't have implied odds to start building a pot. So... In that situation, you might just want to limp and play like a four-way pot with the blinds as well, leave them in. That's a situation where you want a multi-way pot. But here, when the guy's got plenty behind for you to just raise it up, take it down, raise it up, take it down, that's what you want to be doing. You don't want to be limping in and letting someone else ISO him and then putting you in a spot like this where all your initiative goes to hell. You want to be seizing the initiative in position and playing a pot with initiative and position against the bad player. So, very briefly, that's one situation where you might want to actually limp like the shorter stacked situation I just talked about but in general guys like until you understand what you're doing just really take an aggressive game where you're isolating fish in position in position that's the important thing really get into the habit of isolating a lot until you understand more about when is a good spot to limp because this is definitely a good spot to iso on table three here just don't don't limp too much until you've got a better grasp of why you might want to that's all I'm saying keep it simple you know ISO, aggression, C bets, take it down, build pots, get value. That's really all there is to beating these stakes. Have a solid game and do those and you're going to be fine. 
I like the call on table one. You got great pot odds here. Your hand plays okay. Definitely a call. Had C bet the ace eight here on table two against this guy. But he dunks over the pot again here. We've seen him do this before. Um, now it's kind of like you know we might be more inclined to raise. The problem is though, it's not great. I mean, we don't have that much equity. Again, he might just be doing this when he connects with the board. I don't know if he's going to fold. The problem with calling is we have no fold equity once he bets the turn, because a turn bet due to the SPR will commit him. So we can't call here and then play back on the turn. That would be a terrible idea. So it's either raise on the flop, and i just shove it in if I raised on the flop, because you're going to have to commit yourself with any raise, or you're going to have to, or it's going to be a fold. We might be better waiting for another spot, because if we ship this in here, we're going to be risking, like, what's his total stack there? Uh, 765 and 160, it's like 920. We're going to be risking 920, right, just to take down a pot that's currently like 160 plus 150, uh, like 310. So we're not giving ourselves that great a price. We're going to need it to work very often. Let's bring up our trusty friend, the calculator here, just to explain the sort of basic maths behind this. I'm not a much of a maths player as you can possibly tell it's not really my forte but I know enough to get by and that's really if you're good at reading ranges and stuff that's really kind of all you need yes study poker math if it interests you and it will help you a bit but get the basics down and you'll be fine you don't need to go into like crazy crazy equations that are going to tell you things you're never going to have time to do like or even do in any way as an estimate mentally while you're playing because it's just too complicated you can do those for fun and it helps your awareness a bit but as long as I just the main thing with poker math is to get a grasp on the basics of it and understand enough to sort of get by and understand common situations and EV and fold equity and stuff like that get do enough definitely don't neglect it but don't don't shovel loads and loads of time into it because ranges and how to exploit ranges and play against ranges is far more important but definitely do get the basics down. So in this spot we've got a pot of 312 here. Is that right? Yeah. 312 and we'd be shoving in uh, 765 plus we'd be shoving in 920 925 yep so that's the total amount we get back that's our bet plus the pot so we want to do 925 into 1237 So it would have to work 74% of the time if we had no equity in the hand at all to break even. Obviously we have a backdoor flush draw and we have an overcard. Sometimes even two overcards to a pair you might get it in with. We probably only need it to work maybe around 60% given like our equity in the hand. That's an estimate. I could bring up stove, do a whole big range and calculate it but it would take up all of the video that I have left. I don't want to be doing that. Okay. So in this spot, basically, the risk-reward ratio is poor because we do commit ourselves. If we could raise fold and make it like $4 here, that would be a much better price. As you can obviously intuitively see, we wouldn't need it to work as often. But we can't do that here. We would have to call it off. It would be a big mistake to raise fold here. Um, since we can't do that, this is the optimal line. If we do decide to raise, um, we need it to work a hell of a lot. A bit less when you count our equity, but still, we don't have that much equity in the pot here against the likely range for him. So... I like just folding again here. There's better spots that will come up here. We can't call and raising looks too thin without more of a read that he is folding a large amount of the time here after he donks. Because if he's donking here with like 5, 6 and then just getting in, you know, we're getting folds almost never. We're going to need a lot of folds. So just fold again. I like that. So that's basically the sort of math behind it and the sort of idea that you want to consider there. Practice doing these things off the felt and when, when you are playing it will help you like intuitively know what you're doing. You'll be able to make guesses at things a bit quicker. The 3 4 hand here, we're just going to fold on the flop. Our draw is terrible. But yeah, it's a nice little pre. If you guys have any ideas for what. I know it's a while off yet, it's maybe a month and a bit away, or a month away. But for my next series, something you'd really like to see me do more of, or whatever you leave them in my threads or even pm me you know i'm happy for you guys to just message me saying hey do you want to have a shot at this do you want to do this for me um, and i'll take a lot of ideas on board obviously the more feedback we get the better our videos are going to be so 
by all means PM me with ideas or leave ideas in the thread. Ace 8 in middle position, snap open. There's no reason to fold there, you got a good suited ace. You've got a terrible player who's out of position to you in the small blind. It's totally imperative that you open that hand because you want to be playing against him. Your ace 8 is actually going to be killing his range. He's like 70 20 so far, he's probably a weaker fish. He's probably going to flat loads of random king, queen, high, worse aces, random eights and stuff that you're going to dominate. So we're going to be doing absolutely fine versus range. We'll also have possession and initiative to see that. So dream situation, open the ace 8, definitely don't fold that there. Got another guy with possession on us who's kind of loose, but he'll just play so badly and stuff. It's going to be fine. A lot of the a lot of time in these videos, these leak finders, it's going to be just getting people to open wider and take advantage of bad players and play more pots when you've got bad players in the blinds and stuff like that because it is important and you'll get better post flop the more you play post flop so if you feel a bit uncomfortable now just get used to it you know just start really start like playing a wider range when you've got poor players in the blinds and fold equity is going to be good pre flop and unflop and stuff like that so it's cool to start off like ABC and stuff like that but when you get to like stakes like 25 and L you know you've had the micros to practice being ABC and it's now time to start ramping up aggression in position in 6 max, it really is because that's how you'll actually get a decent win rate you don't want to be one of these 1 BB winners, you want to be like a 3 or 4 BB winner at 25 NL so really start playing a lot of pots in position and playing them well on the flop and you'll get there just a matter of practice but definitely open wide-ish So yeah guys, as you've seen, don't. there's no need to record 40 minute sessions, you can do by all means record 40 minute sessions if you want, but generally, like I say, I'm not trawling through these videos finding exact spots, if I wanted exact, exact spots, I wouldn't get a leak finder video, I'd get you guys to send me hand histories, okay, so I don't have to take the time to like trawl through the video to find every hand, the point of these videos is absolutely not that at all, the point of these videos is to see the general game flow of one of your sessions to get a feel for the things you're doing over and over again that you could do better, basically. So that's the point of them. So they don't need to be 45 minutes because enough little things are going to pop up as you've seen that are big things that, you know, they seem like little things but when you're doing them over and over again like folding king 9 there, it's going to be plus EV, you've got a bad player in the button who's going to fold a lot in the flop due to having a weak range and you're going to flop top pair and get value from them and stuff like that. You've got two guys in the blinds that aren't giving you much trouble. Open the king nine, you know. Um, it, may, it may be that you only make like a fifth of the big blind every time you open that or something. But if you run that out a hundred times, you know, that's already like a good bit of money. And it, these situations are so, so common that it's worthwhile doing this game flow leak finder video and fixing them as soon as possible. Because the more of these you fix, the more your win rate goes up. Simple as that. So that's why I say it's more about the actual flow of your session as opposed to what do we do in this really interesting hand. I can do member hand history reviews, just let me know if you want that as a future series, but the point of this is to plug all these little niggly things, and that's what we're doing. King 5, just a check. Um, You could lead this flop, you've got some equity, but it's, it is all over their ranges, like they're, you're not going to have much fold equity and your draw's not that great, so I'm okay just check folding to be honest on the turn again, loads of hands connect that jack and this board connect with the jack and this board so check folding seems fine your draw is terrible now go ahead and bet the river for like 60-70 cents or something no one else is going to bet here, don't bluff catch, they're not going to bluff this river enough more likely you'll just get called by like 8x or something so yeah I like that, the sizing seems good you can call the a6 here, it's suited, you're getting a good enough price you got a bad player so looks fine don't want to squeeze to isolate him there because he's just never folding. Your hand doesn't have enough equity to do it for value. So, yeah, go ahead and flat. Just check fold this board on table four. Not enough equity or fold equity to stab here. How am I doing for time? Yeah, okay. We've been going for quite a while, so I'm probably going to wrap up um, just now. Not a whole lot of other interesting spots going on. But yeah, we've got another three in this series. Like I say, I've got one spot left for you guys to send me more videos. So we got through 16 minutes there. That's the sort of 
average. But maybe 20 minutes. I had quite a few things to talk about there. So I'd say 20 minutes is kind of the average. So you don't need to. You can make your videos this long if you like. If you're just playing a session, you just record it all. Fine, whatever. But just in the interest of file size and blah blah blah. If you're sending me one of these, you can make it. You can make it smaller than that. That's fine. Um, yeah. So one more spot. PM me. Also PM me with ideas and you know whatever you want basically. And I will. I'll be back in ten days from now, roughly, at the end of the month. I'll be making episode three, um, and that will be with Grinder School member No Get No Deg. I think. I'll double check that, but I think it is. He's going to be sending me a video of the same thing, so look forward to much of the same. And remember, all these leaks I've talked about today are very common, common, common leaks for players at these limits. So they will apply to a lot of you, so please go back and make sure that if they apply to you, um, that you're going to fix them and not make the same mistakes and stuff like that. Generally, just make a ISO sizing, 3-bit sizing. Why are we 3-bitting? What I'd say um, for K4... 5606 like his main thing would be right now is to concentrate on his sizing with his iso raises and his three bits and mainly like just to do some work on three betting do some work on what hands are good to three bet and why and just really try and understand why you're three betting in spots and not just doing it for the hell of it basically um just work on that that's important and yeah please leave any comments questions in the thread and I'll speak to you guys soon, and good luck.